Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Welcome, friends, to Health, Psychology, and Human Nature with André Stureson, a science-focused podcast where we explore, learn, and improve our lives together. In today's interesting episode, I talk with the great storyteller and Professor Emeritus Brian Fagan, and we do a deep dive into our history. What we talk about specifically is the first modern Europeans, the Cro-Magnon, who they were, how they lived, how they were different from Neanderthals, how they were different from us, their culture, what they ate, and much more. If you want to learn more, please check out Brian's book, Cro-Magnon, How the Ice Age Gave Birth to the First Modern Humans. Brian Fagan is a professor emeritus of anthropology who have written several archaeology books, one of which is the Cro-Magnon, How the Ice Age Gave Birth to the first modern humans. Friends, please enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you. It's uh, it's an honor to have you on. I'm very thank you, thankful for you taking your time. No, it's a pleasure. Great. I, we were just discussing that. I've, I've understood that you like sailing. Yes, I'm a sailor of... Since I was year, eight years old, I've been a sailor, and I'm not a racing sailor, I'm a, I was a cruising sailor. I've kind of retired now, but I did a lot of it in my when I was young. Okay, so, so no sailing adventures for right now? I do go sailing, I'm going sailing tomorrow actually, uh, with some friends in a 22-foot boat, but uh, I've kind of retired because I'm not as nimble as I used to be. <laughs> Climbing around in boats is for younger people. I think you sound it's quite nimble, people. though. Hmm? You, you sound nimble, I think. Well, thank you. I do my best. No, <laughs> it's getting up on decks on small boats in waves. Yeah. You know, it's very uh, a matter of safety. You've just got to be very careful. Uh, and I decided about a year ago that I'm kind of slowing down on it. Yeah. I no longer own a boat, which is good because that's very expensive, although it's a wonderful thing to have. <laughs> It is, and there's also some work to it, right? You have a, you have to work with the, with the boat to to make it not oh, yes. go, not go apart and oh, a great deal of work yeah. and the costs of insurance and, and keeping the boat in a, a a marina now is very expensive. And uh, I was lucky when I was young; it was cheaper, so I did it. And I crossed the Atlantic under sail and did things like that. I still sail locally just for the fun of it. Right. So that's that's when your adventures began, and now you're doing adventures in a lot of different subjects, or you have for quite a while, though. Yes, I am one of the few archaeologists in the world who really is a generalist. I deal with everything from human origins up to the archaeology of the Industrial Revolution. I was even involved briefly in a preliminary investigation of a collapsed movie set put together by a famous Hollywood producer in the 1920s called Cecil B. DeMille. He made a movie called The Ten Commandments and made a huge replica of an Egyptian temple and put it together on some sand dunes hmm. on the coast here. And when he finished, he collapsed it and they've now dug it up, which was interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. And, and today we're going to talk about one of your books, one of your subjects, and it's about, I think this is very fascinating. So this is about the first modern Europeans. Is that right? Yes. And I, I, I thought if you, we will get into uh, to these 
in a in a while. But I will start if you just could just give us like a a, a short summary about these these individuals when they who like who were they? These people were the first modern human beings to settle in Europe. They were anatomically modern like us. They were intellectually had the same capacity as us. They appear to have arrived, and there is controversy over this, sometime probably just before 40,000 years ago. They came here, we think, from the Middle East, but the origins of modern humans go back much further to about 300,000 years ago, at least in tropical Africa. So they are originally, ultimately, ultimately Africans, but they were in the Near East or Middle East by about 80 to 90, the date is uncertain. And at some point they moved into Europe somewhere probably in the mid 40,000s, I would think. And there they settled and within 20,000 years or so, again, the date is much debated, they, uh, the Neanderthals who were there before them, the archaic humans of Europe, vanished. And why they vanished is a matter of great controversy. Yeah. And the these people who are named in much of the popular literature, the Kurumanyons, named after a cave or rock shelter rather, near the village of Les Aisy in southwestern France, where in 1868 they were digging uh, preparations for the railroad station at Les Aisy, and they uncovered a sealed rock shelter, and in it an archaeologist found three human skeletons which were those of modern people, quite unlike the Neanderthals who had been found some years before with the big brow ridges and so on. Right. And ever since then, uh, the first Europeans informally, although it's not strictly accurate, uh, are called by many people Cromagnons. <coughs> in fact, in the, <coughs> sorry, in the scientific literature, <coughs> excuse me. No worries, no worries. They're known as anatomically modern humans. And, and when you say that, when you when, when you say that they're an anatomically modern, what what does if you can you give an example of that? What does that mean, being anatomically? <coughs> if you ran into a Cro-Magnon in the street, you would not probably look at them any differently because they would look very much like us. In recent years. They've done some very, very sophisticated sophist um, uh, facial recognition research on the Cro-Magnon skulls, and they've discovered that the ones which they known for a long time they were round-headed, but they did not have brow ridges. They probably were fairly short, and they stood upright like we do, and their brain capacity was identical to ours. What is interesting, however, is that they appear to have had fairly dark skins. The skin color was dark. Right. They've noticed that on another skull going back 10,000 years in Britain. Uh, whether this is in fact reality or a reflection of their, at this point, rather remote African origin, nobody knows. Right. But would you say that? So let's say that you would you would take a, a, a baby from from this period of time and just put it in a time machine and and taking it to it to us fun. now like would 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 we think that that um individual would be just like anybody no i think you'd be to have a trouble recognizing as anything else yeah yeah so it's it a be, modern human yeah yeah it's a modern human yeah that's that, that's quite interesting and and because this is quite fascinating so what during what time range did they live in Europe? So they came for about you said about forty forty five thousand years ago, right? Yes. The, uh, let me just say one other thing on on the Caramanio, what they were like. One of the recent, much of the recent research has revolved around genetics and DNA, and it is clear that uh, they are fairly ancient. 
and the genetic history of them is turning out to be very complicated. But when you look at the age, the earliest in the 40,000s or somewhere around there, they were certainly the only humans in Europe, the modern humans, by 25,000 years ago. And then you get into the issue of what is their ancestry? How do they survive today? Which is complicated by the fact that DNA shows us that there were considerable influxes of later people when agriculture began, right. say around 6000 BC or around there. So we are, uh, we have deep youths, some of which do probably go back to the Comanios, but may, many of our roots are in fact out of the earliest farmers who are somewhat late. It's very, very complex and much debated scene. Mm -hmm. um, my genetics, oddly enough, or DNA, uh, contains a significant amount of Neanderthal. Mine too, so actually. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> but but so so the Cro Magnons, they lived. They came about forty thousand years ago, and and they and they lived until uh, probably about. It's hard to tell, but fifteen thousand years or twenty thousand years ago, or during this time period. Some of their genetics are still in us. Yeah. They are traditional late Ice Age culture, which is, of course, the late Ice Age cold adaptation and the culture they have with that survived right to the end of the Ice Age. And then when warming started around in earnest about 12,000 years ago, uh, 12,000 BC or so, they... Uh, their culture changed a lot. They became much more adapted toward coasts and forests, but anatomically they were still the same. Right. Uh, culture changes, so does human evolution, but much slower. But so and so th so they start. They came about forty thousand years ago, and then the the ice age started to change. Um, could the, you just the ice age was already changing. The the big myth about the ice age which goes back at least one and a half million years, yeah. is that it was one and a half million years of complete deprease. Yeah. It was not. There were at least nine, probably more, periods of intense cold called glaciations. But between them were often quite long periods of much warmer climate, sometimes mm. even maybe warmer than today in mm. Europe. And ice sheets melted, sea levels rose, and all that. Very, very complicated <laughs> geological history, which we're only now beginning to decipher with the help of ice cores from Greenland and elsewhere. So one of the things about the Cromanians and indeed the Neanderthals was that they had to be extremely adaptive and very flexible and capable of adopting to both extreme cold and extreme warmth, wow. or not extreme wow. warmth, but temperate conditions. And certainly Cremanual culture became increasingly elaborate, probably a reflection to some degree of constantly changing climatic conditions. Right. But how, how, how could you explain like, like the, the living environment from about 40,000 years ago to about 15,000 years ago? Like how, how, yeah, could you, could you explain the, yeah, the environment in, in which these lived in which the cro magnons lived? It, they lived in basically a cold environment at the height of the cold periods, one of which was around 30,000, another one about 25,000, another one about 18,000. There were nine month winters, weeks on end of sub zero temperatures. There was open steppe, uh, shrub between Western Europe and Siberia. And the places where people tended to live were deep river valleys like those in southwestern France, for example. Spain was an important refuge. So was central, uh, the Danube area, where there was greater shelter. When the climate warmed up, the people 
moved out into broader environments. They probably had slightly shorter winters. They had higher temperatures in summer and they spent more life in open encampments. Mm. We don't really know the details, but it's clear that there was sort of constant flexibility and you were constantly on the move. Most of what we know about the Cro-Magnons comes from cave sites and rock shelters in southwest France and central Europe and Spain, which were clearly occupied during the winters, maybe also the summers, and were occupied sporadically over very, very long periods of time. But the adaptation was constant, the flexibility mentally and physically was constant, and their toolkit had to reflect this flexibility and ability right. to survive both in cold and in warm conditions. And and this is quite interesting because you mentioned in the beginning that the Cro-Magnons had a cognitive ability just like our own that we have these days. And that must have been something that is, has been a real, a true resource during these changing times and these very tough climates to be able to, I mean, I mean be creative, come up with new ideas, to be able to 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 manufacture tools that more, are more advanced and to be able to yeah cooperate in in perhaps a way that that other that other people at this time weren't able to let's make one thing absolutely clear yeah the old image of the neanderthals as primitive cave people who dragged their women around by their hair <laughs> and had clubs yeah. has been discredited for nearly a hundred years. It's nonsense. Yeah. The Neanderthals were extremely skilled, adept hunters, men and women of great strength and considerable ability. There was a huge debate about how much language they had, what were their intellectual abilities? But there was absolutely no question that they were perfectly capable of surviving for long periods of sub-zero weather, even out on the open steppe, although this was not normal. When you come, the difference technologically was that the Neanderthals had far simpler more rudimentary technology, and they did not make, as far as we know, heavy use of bone and ivory. When you come to the cro the modern humans, think of the Swiss army knife with all those different tools which are attached to the central hinge or the chassis. What the, Neander the modern humans did was to develop a technology using stone which allowed them to carve and slice and split bone and ivory. And this chassis of the antler immediately allowed them to make spear points in later times, arrowheads, they had scrapers, they had chisels, they had needles. And the needle, oddly enough, is one of the most important artifacts ever developed. Hmm. Why? Because it enabled people not only to cut furs with and skins with sharp flint knives, but it enabled women to take thongs and to sew tailor-made clothing which fitted people closely so they could wear layers of clothing. Think of Helly Hansen sailing garments. The whole thing, which had brilliant clothes, are based on layers. And the Cro-Magnons were able to survive comfortably in sub-zero temperatures and even hunt under such conditions because they had layered clothing made with needles. And this technological uh, ability, apart from enhanced intellectual qualities like being able to plan ahead and think abstractly, were what enabled them be, to be extraordinarily successful. 
Yeah, that is, I mean, to be able to to do something like, like that, that also has other demands on your cognitive skills, right? So to be able to make a needle and then use the needle, it's something that, because that is, is that something that the Neanderthals could do as well? Uh, probably to some degree, yes. Yeah. We don't know. <clears throat> but it is fascinating because, for example, my wife, is a quilter. She makes quilts, she weaves, and she sews. And the fascinating thing about this is to watch her thinking about what she's going to do. Yeah. <laughs> and planning yeah. it out. Yeah. That's what the Neanderthal women did. You never give any That's suggestions <laughs> to your wife about the sewing? Say again? You never give any, any, any thoughts of the, the sewing at home? No. 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 <laughs> okay. I've tried... Uh, Flaking stone tools, which is an art which is learned on people. It's, it's big, very popular over here. A lot of people do it. Yeah. It's not easy. Once you get the knack of it, it is. Yeah. An awful lot of these things are mindsets. Yeah. And one of the strengths of Comanion culture or life must have been an extraordinary ability to collaborate on the hunt, for example or collecting plant foods when they were available, or spearing fish. All these things required <clears throat> a level of cooperation, which was critical. You can only see this in Native American cultures where they hunted bison on the Great Plains, or you can see it in ways in which people hunted elephants. It, it, it's needs not only the ability to cooperate, it needs an ability to communicate. And one of the most important things about it probably were the relationships between people, kin ties. Yeah, yeah. And you knew people over quite considerable distances. If you judge by the exotic objects you sometimes find in Cro-Magnon sites, and this is something that compared with Neanderthals is quite striking. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also, I just, I'm just trying to, you know, trying to imagine how it would be like to be a modern human. So a, 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 an individual who's pretty much like us living in such harsh conditions and moving around and hunting together. And, you know, it's, 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 it has to be an existence that is quite, quite similar to ours, but still, uh, I mean, still quite different as well. Oh, yes. And back in the early years of the 20th century, there was a period when experts on the Stone Age directly compared the Cro-Magnons to the Inuit and Eskimo of the Canadian and American Arctic. This very soon became obvious that this was not a good direct comparison. But there are things we can learn from Inuit and Eskimo culture which really are relevant. <clears throat> One of them, and I have a huge admiration for Inuit and Eskimo culture, one of it is a fantastically detailed knowledge of the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Of the habits of game, of animals, seasons of plant foods, times when fish migrate up rivers, and on top of that, in a way, what you might today call weather forecasting. Yeah. They had to develop a great skill of knowing where the weather situation was, what was going to come. They would probably be able to forecast snow and temperatures falling maybe two or three days ahead, Yeah, which is the same as medieval not, uh, weather people in England who practice what has been called church steeple meteorology, where they would look at the clouds from the top of a church yeah. and try and predict the weather. They knew the heavenly bodies or some of them, they must have known cloud formations and what they bring. And above all, they lived in an environment of which they were an intimate part. And they lived alongside animals, 
from small insects up to woolly rhinos and mammoth and reindeer, and they developed an extraordinary knowledge of their habits and customs. Yeah. And the other thing, which is truly remarkable, and you see this with Inuit, as you do with other hunters, is their ability to stalk and get close to their prey. Yeah. Because the, one of the most critical things about the Gramagnons is that to kill, they relied on spears and harpoons, which were thrown. Yeah. And even if you had a throwing stick called a throwing, uh, a spear thrower, which increased the range and the velocity, you still had to get very, very close to the animal. Yeah. Have you ever stood on one foot for two minutes, not moving? <laughs> well, no, that was commonplace. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They had a sensitivity to the environment and animals that to us is virtually unknown. Yeah. And I found this with fishermen. Some of the older fishermen I knew when I was young, their knowledge of the conditions under which they fished the ocean and the fish, even the seabed was extraordinary. Yeah. And mean, it was the secret of their success. Yeah. I mean, you can only imagine how, um, let's say like a, a fully grown man or woman being able, I mean, working on honing their skills to survive in that environment. You can only imagine meeting such a such an individual. How how <laughs> how extremely good they must have been in a lot of skills that we today don't or don't know anything about at all. Do you have a cat or a dog? No, but I, I've had cats before. Because if you look at cats, uh, we have three cats. Yeah. And in our, our garden, sometimes a cat will suddenly appear next to you. They are so yeah. quiet. <laughs> yeah. And if you look at Inuit hunters, and I've been out too with uh, sand hunters in the Kalahari Desert in Africa, they move like ghosts. Yeah. And this is something you learn from birth. Yeah. I mean... A seven-year-old boy, in the days when people had bows and arrow, could probably shoot a bird on the wing. Yeah. And these skills are taught by immersion, by getting people involved, by practice, by oral tradition, where information is passed from one generation to the next, and just sheer experience alongside others because the biggest virtue is that this is although often solitary very often is teamwork yeah, yeah and the skills needed were kind of passed from one generation to the next by word of mouth and example and there is nothing more powerful isn't that also one thing that is um uh, uh, love to know is is that also something that is um special with the modern human the the language capacity or is that also the same with uh, the neanderthals for example oh yes there's no question that the Romanians had fully articulate speech because when you look at Romanians, sometimes you almost feel they're like us yeah. The most famous manifestation of Cro-Magnon culture is, of course, their art, which is truly extraordinary by any standards. But originally, people thought this was art just done for the sake of doing art, which a lot of art is in our culture. But in fact, the art was part of a very, very complex sophisticated, ever-changing relationship with the environment, the natural world, and the world of animals. The world was alive. It was full of living beings and plants, and also with the supernatural world and its powerful forces, like wind and flood and so on, 
And of course, the intermediaries for this were very often the ancestors, because the one most fundamental thing behind most of these societies was a belief, and I'm sure this was true of the Cromagnons, that life for you would be the same for your successors. And the knowledge passed on was changed very little. Yeah. And the other thing you have to realize, Andre, is that life expectancy for most people was probably in their 20s. Whoa. I've read some of that an age of 28 was probably quite close to the average. And medieval peasants in Europe, the average age was 28, and their lives were really harsh. But the thing about the Cro-Magnons, these were hunters. They lived and hunted at close quarters with very dangerous animals yeah. like wild oxen and they and bison. And there must have been a large number of fatal hunting injuries. For sure. So your whole attitude to life was very different from that of ours. If you were 50 or 60, you probably were almost revered. <laughs> you were yeah. an elder or an outlier and elders have enormous power in these societies yeah you know you're dealing with a um, really sophisticated culture but a great deal of pro magnon culture for all the glories of their art and their artifacts there was the huge sophistication of their cognitive life, of their spiritual life, of their beliefs. And the only way we can really understand or get an insight is to take a look at Australian Aborigines. Their theoretical life, their cognitive life is incredibly sophisticated. Yeah. And one of the great losses of the last 200 years is that so much of it has been lost because the knowledge and experience behind this is really remarkable. Yeah. It's interesting how, how, how big of a portion of life, spirituality or what you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what to call it, but, but the belief in something greater than yourself, it's, it's interesting how that is such a, I don't know, it's such an important part of human nature. That's something that we have had for so long. It's quite, yeah, it's quite fascinating. It's, it's very, very striking. I mean, you find it in Native American storytelling and religious beliefs. You find it in all kinds of different societies. And it seems to revolve, and I'm no expert on this, believe me, various things. <laughs> One is what is is explaining the world. And almost in many societies, almost invariably, there is a creation figure, a creation legend. Yeah. The most famous one probably, and this of course is much later, is that of the ancient Egyptians who believed that their life originated in the water and then there was an earthen mound. The, uh, one of the most important mythical figures in Native American religious beliefs is the raven. Yeah. Good, bad, a trickster, a good thing. And stories around the raven abound. You have the same thing with uh, all kinds of creative legends. And storytelling revolving around the legends is enormously important. Then the next thing that's very important is the relationship with animals. And with animals as people, they were individuals, they had qualities. And kin groups were named often after animals. And then there's the whole thing of the ancestors. But in the middle of all this, in a large number of societies, and I'm pretty sure, although I'm guessing, because a lot of this, Andre, is tan intangible. We don't know. Archaeologists deal with objects like spearheads or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We're dealing with beliefs and ideas here. So we're projecting. Yeah. But I think what we're projecting is reasonable, given the amount we know now about 
non-Western societies, traditional societies. But I think an awful lot of this revolved around acquiring knowledge. You never stopped acquiring knowledge, which is something we forget. Experience, passing information on to the young and the old alike. Uh, all of this, it all revolved around this, and it also all revolved around the nature of the world and communicating with the supernatural world. And in the societies, almost certainly, there were shamans. The word shaman is, of course, a Siberian word, but let's talk about spirit medium, whatever you want to call them. These are people who are perceived as having a special relationship with the supernatural world. And in many societies, when you became an ancestor, you became an intermediary between the people who were living and the forces of the supernatural world. But shamans or spirit mediums are people perceived as having special qualities, often acquired in solitude, powerful supernatural powers, which enabled them to travel in a trance, perhaps using hallucinogenic substances. Yeah. Because one thing that all societies living as hunter-gatherers have is an encyclopedic knowledge of plants and the medicinal qualities of plants. And these trances enabled them to pass into the supernatural world, have visions, communicate with the forces of the supernatural world, and to make pronouncements. Now, how you became a shaman, and there is, again, a huge literature, and how you became successful is fascinating. It must have been a matter of understanding popular opinion in a band or whatever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But this whole relationship with the supernatural permeates Cro-Magnon culture, yeah. even if to us it's indirect. But the only way we can really look at it is to look at their engravings and cave paintings. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's, I think it's interesting to think about what this says about us as human beings, because this is also something that, that is, seems that we, that we seem to have in a lot of different cultures. We have some, some link to, to another world or whatever. And, and it's, it's quite interesting to, yeah, to try to understand why, like what, why, yeah, what, what, what the, I'm, I'm thinking more of a, like in a, an evolutionary term, like what, what the advantage would be to have or to believe in these things and to have people that can, or somebody in your group that can tell you, I, I mean, the things that are about the other world. And I know what, what are your thoughts about the advantages of having a shaman? I think the advantages are enormous. I, I mean, you've got in South America and the Amazon, you have this huge emphasis on hallucinogens. Yeah. They are a central part of South American Indian life and were very, very important for achieving understanding. If you look at any culture, you will find that there are ways that people acquire reassurance. Yeah. And if you look at the Kermanians, you're looking at people who lived in what one can only call a predator-rich environment. Now, if you live in, or lived in Africa when the game hadn't largely been destroyed, you would have lived in a predator-rich environment. And that is something, because I've <clears throat> lived, for example, for a while in part of the Zambezi Valley where there were plenty of lions. It's like with bears in Canada, you tread very carefully. 
Yeah. And if you live in a culture with a lot of very dangerous animals around, you are very careful to develop a cautious and respectful relationship with them. Yeah. There is some very interesting research done some years ago on African wild bison, bison, buffalo, or bison, I forget which they call them. And it was shown that if you walked carefully and respectfully in the open among a herd of buffalo, they would tend to ignore you. But directly you start hiding and stalking, they're on the defensive. Mm. So animals observe you as much as you observe them. And you guys can see that even in my cats. <laughs> no, really. Yeah, I mean, yeah. My relationship with yeah. cats is yeah, yeah, really yeah. close. Uh, and when uh, I, a cat, my cat doesn't want me to, to write, it'll come and sit on the keyboard, and that's the end of it. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it really is. Um, so a lot of this is connected with how you live with the world. And the most dramatic example, I think, is the Australian Aborigines. A lot of them live in desert. And the big problem in desert is one word, water. And there are, and alas, and most of this was lost. There is a thing called the dream time and the Australian dream time, which is really a mythic existence, included ways of making one's way from one water source to another. And these weren't necessarily lakes or rivers. They might be places where you can dig down and find water, a teeny spring, a water seep from a cliff. Mm. And the people had oral traditions featuring mythic beasts or mythic figures who would guide them through this la apparently waterless landscape. And they followed these directions for generations. That's what an awful lot of this is. It is finding your way through a world which is not all benign, yeah. but a world that you treat with respect. And I'm sure that one of the reasons the Cremagnons were successful was because they had a very sophisticated understanding of the world they lived in and the forces that were behind it. Yeah. One thing that I've, I, I've thought about now while we were speaking, well, when we've been talking is, do you think that the ability to learn and to come up with new ideas and be creative and, I mean, this, this mental mental ability that we have as human beings would you, do you think that that is probably the biggest advantage that we have had and why why the cro magians became so successful or what what do you think is the most important thing i think probably and i'm guessing here the most likely reason that we were successful were three things one are fully articulate speech which enabled us to communicate not only facts, but feelings. I mean, not just the fact, oh, there's a lion over there, but a lot more than that. Secondly, our ability to plan ahead. And thirdly, just the fact that we had memories and we had an ability to learn far more than just how to hunt or how to gather plants. You're talking about skills that are much more intangible but vital in our existence. Why, why did you think it's? Why, why do you think it was such an advantage to be able to talk about feelings and emotions? Why was it important? Yeah, yeah. One of the things you learn about, I learned in Black African society in Africa was, and this of course was a long time ago, that one of the huge, really important parts of daily life was unspoken conversation, where you would communicate with people non-verbally without saying a word. This isn't 
part of what I was brought up with. Of course, I'm British ultimately, which means that <laughs> one is far <laughs> different anyhow. But, uh, the, but it, this ability of nonverbal communication was incredibly central. And I believe it was for Comagnons too, because remember, you're living in small bands, you know people really well. You don't always oh, like being married for a long time. You don't have to talk all the time and say, I love you, or I don't like this. They can tell from your body language. Yeah. But in these societies where a great deal of life, and this is me speculating, was spent hunting, or you had to be quiet, hmm. nonverbal communication was important. And a lot of Africans always told me that Europeans were rather crude. They were. They um, don't use nonverbal communication. And that's very true. You see it with American culture all over the place. Apart from the idiocies of the, the present unmentionable president, you still, Americans are very brash, yeah. which I find difficult sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is also a thing that you just mentioned. I mean, just, you know, living with just this one group your entire life. It's, that's also, also such a, I mean, it's such a different way of living compared to now. Of course, you, you still have your, in most cases, you still have your family and everything. But it's also such a big difference to, I, and it would also be interesting to know how big the groups were. <laughs> how big were the groups? It varied tremendously. Yeah. There were people, and it's interesting you mentioned, I was just about to get into this, the out on the open steppe, where distances were enormous and the population was very scattered, there probably were people who maybe met 35, 40 people in their whole lives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You meet 35 or 40 people in a day. Yeah, 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 yeah. But on top, using the word meeting and a, a, a more meaningful way, even smaller number. But in places like the valley of the Vézère in southwest France uh, uh, or parts of the River Thames in England, the population was probably considerably denser to the point that there were individual hunting territories with well-defined boundaries and you had constant communications with other neighboring groups. Yeah. And you probably had kin who lived maybe 20 miles away. Yeah. And you saw them regularly. So, and in the summers, probably a lot of these bands got together for trade, to arrange marriages, for all sorts of different reasons, resolve disputes, even for common or hunts. Yeah. So, the dynamics of daily existence in, say, the Zayzair Valley, where there were numerous caves, and the open steppe or the central European plains were very, very different. But and it's worth mentioning, everybody knew what solitude was, what silence was, and everybody had to be self-reliant. And that is a vital thought. Uh, and a lot of these skills, as you say, are gone. What we forget, Andre, very often, we try and interpret the Cro-Magnons as if they were 20th, first century suburban Europeans. Yeah. They were not. They were people living in a world and with a culture totally different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally different. That's before you get into what language they speak, which of course we don't know, and all that sort of stuff. But the, it was a very different world and extremely difficult for us to interpret. I mean, only such a thing that, I mean, as we just discussed, even though biologically we're probably very much the same, I mean, just living in a, a small group your entire life, never meeting anybody else, almost, I mean, it's a couple like 35 times in a lifetime or something, I don't know. I mean, all these things also must have really influenced, I mean, the group dynamic, how the people in the group were interacting probably with each other, how they were functioning as a society. I mean, all of these things must really, really must have it's such, I don't know, it's just such an interesting thing to try to understand, like, how how it was for them to live in, 
yeah, in these sm smaller bands. This is a very interesting point you raise because it's something I've been thinking about. Because here down in Southern California, when the whole of coastal California, we are facing the issue of population density. Yeah. And we're facing the issue of high density housing, which and living, which is a problem also in Shanghai and London, probably in Stockholm, uh, all kinds of different places. And one of the fascinating things is watching people adapting to such high density living. And one of the things it does do is make you very conscious of privacy and very conscious of your need to be courteous and considerate. Yeah. And one of the big premiums in hunting societies has been sharing, has been cooperation, and so on. And it's fascinating to see people grappling with the fact they're going to live in an apartment block in close juxtaposition with other people in a family unit. Yeah. How do you handle it? Yeah. Compared with suburbia where you live with individual houses. I live in an area where there are houses close by, but we barely know the neighbors. We know one couple very well. The others we don't, yeah. nor do we have any need to. Yeah. In an apartment block, you really do, because the whole issue of anonymity and cooperation comes up again and again. This is a very fascinating thing. In a way, we're almost beginning to relearn some things to go Magnon's practice daily. Yeah. Well, and with the, the Cro-Magnons, you also said that they, they were cooperating when they were hunting. And, I, and yeah, I also think that you mentioned that with, there was these mammoths. The question which is, is fascinating about all Cro-Magnon hunting was to what extent did they concentrate <clears throat> on large animals? The headlines always go to the woolly rhino, yeah, yeah, the mammoth, sure. <laughs> of course, the big spectacular animals. Yeah, this is particularly true, for example, of the first Americans, because everyone is convinced they lived with mammoth, which they didn't. Yeah, <laughs> but one has to realize that these animals are very difficult to hunt. Yeah, and really, the only way you could effectively, probably, I'm just guessing here, kill a mammoth was if the mammoth got into a swamp and stuck, yeah, got stuck in heavy snow, or was somehow immobilized by falling into a pit which you had dug. So it was, in a way, defenseless, and you could approach it with large numbers of spears at close range. When you get to animals slightly less formidable, like wild oxen, or bison, it is theoretically at any rate possible to jump on their backs and spear them through their hearts, which we believe the Neanderthals did, and probably Cro-Magnons. The real prey for people like Cro-Magnons were medium-sized animals, particularly animals who live in herds, yeah. gregarious animals, of which the most classic, of course, is the reindeer. And reindeer, which are depicted in much of the art, wild horses, are much easier to hunt by driving. And particularly in the case of reindeer, of preying on the mass migrations in spring and autumn when they move back and forth between winter and summer feeding grounds. Yeah. And this was an extremely well orchestrated hunt, which involved cooperation, because what you were doing literally was harvesting animals. And you had two issues. It's no use killing 20 reindeer unless you have developed a system for A, butchering them systematically, and B, preserving the food for later use. 
Yeah. And that's what people forget. And there is there were vivid accounts and some marvelous archaeology too, actually, of bison hunts on the Great Plains where the butchery was on a nearly industrial scale. I mean, gangs of women and men just butchered while others killed the animals. Hmm. But you had to butcher and kill fast, because a butcher and process to beat fast, because otherwise it's spoiled. Yeah. The same applies to salmon runs. And they think that Cromagnons, in fact, exploited salmon runs. But occasionally, you have one issue and one issue alone. That meat follows, spoils fast. So you've got to dry it as fast as you can quickly as you can. So you've got all kinds of logistics like that. But I think a great deal of Cro-Magno hunting was firstly exploiting mass migrations and herd animals, and B, a great deal of small game, hunting Arctic ptarmigan, the birds, for example, trapping them, hmm. trapping Arctic hares, and so on. And a big animal, a really big animal like a mammoth, must have been a major event in the people who killed their lives, something that was talked about for years. Yeah, yeah. It's all a question of vulnerability. And of course, the other thing about reindeer, for example, is you can watch them very closely. And some of the experts say that the cave paintings, some of them actually depict the type of fur which the animal hide or the state of the hide at different seasons of the year mm, wow they, they're animals ah. but what what did the cro eat though was was it i mean was it mostly a, a a meat diet or what were they what what were their diet like again it's very misleading because what we know about are all the animals because bone survives much better <coughs> excuse me no than worries. any form of organic food like fish bones uh, plant remains and so on these are small and it's only in the last 30 years and particularly the last 10 that they've developed methods of re re preserving and recovering large numbers of plant foods like teeny seeds, a technique which involves floating seeds through water so that you can recover large numbers of them, because you really can't tell much about what people ate without statistical treatment and large animal uh, samples. This method called flotation has been used extensively in the Middle East with great success looking at the origins of agriculture. Mm. But, and then you've got other things like fish bones. Fish bone, believe it or not, there are people who spend their whole careers studying ancient fish bones. But it's very revealing that now they know so much about it, they can actually tell you the weight of the fish that were caught. Really? Yeah, that's yep. fascinating. No, this, I mean, this may sound silly, but it's not. Because if you, for example, have got uh, a thousand fish bones and 80% of them are fish weighing, say, one kilogram with very few smaller and larger, that tells you straight off that they were going for the adult fish. Yeah. In the case of uh, cattle, for example, this is a bit off cro but it's worth making the point. Uh, I once dug a site with a large number of cattle bones, and most of the cattle bones were of young adults in their prime. And we finally theorized that what they were doing was killing the large animals. They were killing the surplus males, because for breeding purposes, you need very few, whereas you need lots of females. So most of the young adults were eaten for meat in their prime. And it's stuff like that they're beginning to do. So to answer your question, I suspect that the Cro-Magnons ate a much wider range of plant foods than we realize, and they somehow stored them. Yeah. Uh, and also, 
they may well, certainly in the Vezea and Les Aviers, they did, they probably relied heavily at times on salmon runs because salmon runs are easy to observe, they're predictable, and it's very easy to spear fish and, uh, like when they're crowded in like that. And believe me, there was nothing the Kamangongs didn't know about spearing things. <laughs> no, and then, uh, you know, they may have taken birds, they certainly trapped them. I would say the, the diet probably was very varied, with probably meat being an important part of it. Yeah. And the, and the Chromatons, they were, I mean, they, they were isolated from other human species, except for the Neanderthals, for uh, quite a long period of time, right? Yep. Yeah. So they, they, they lived alongside them. Exactly, they lived alongside them. What what would you say if you, if we compare them to the, to the Neanderthals? What would you say were the the biggest differences between the Cro-Magnon and the Neanderthals? Oh, no question at all that it was uh, cognitive ability, intellectual abilities, speech, and the technology, but the increased sophistication of Cro-Magnon technology and the ways in which they used it were a direct result of enhanced technical uh, cognitive abilities. Right. No question. So it's, Absolutely no question about that. So it was the, it was the enhanced the cognitive skills. But the Neanderthals, their brain is, uh, is, has been... Uh, has has been thought to be quite or has to, to be oh, yes, as big not. as the Cro-Magnons, right? Or no, different areas of the brain were were developed more strongly in modern humans. Frankly, I don't know much about this. No, okay, yeah. I, I looked at the before before we talked. I looked at the, a YouTube video where they were comparing Cro-Magnon a Cro-Magnon skull with a Neanderthal skull and a human a contemporary human skull. And uh, yeah, it, it was quite a big difference that the Neanderthal's skull was more like a American football. If you mm -hmm. compare it to the Cro, if you compare it to, to the Cro Magnons. Oh, oh, absolutely, yes. No, um, and the areas clearly were less developed were those with speech and uh, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they they were interesting because you get this scenario with big debates. Because you had this period in Europe where there were Neanderthals and moderns living on the same continent. Yeah. Question, how did the Neanderthals become extinct and why? And what was the relationship between them? Exactly, yeah. Uh, when I wrote the book, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Yeah. And it became, I, I, I'm convinced that they lived alongside each other, but actually saw each other probably pretty rarely. They knew they were there, mm. but they were very cautious with each other. Mm. They had no illusions about who was strong and so on. Uh, and certainly if there was competition with their enhanced weapon ability, the Neanderthals were probably inferior. One thing uh, I'm sure a modern human had learned, or some of them had learned, you do not get into a quarrel with the animals. <laughs> no. You're yeah. going to be overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, having said all that, of course, there is this mu much publicized genetic evidence of intermarriage or interbreeding between uh, Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals and Ninisovans in Siberia, uh, this, to put it mildly, must have been rare, I would think, but it seems to have occurred, and there must have been some more close relationships. There's no question they must have occasionally bartered things like skins or meat or things like that, uh, but I doubt, I think the Neanderthals, in the end, uh, died out because they were kind of on marginal territory. They were marginalized by the modern humans sort of becoming more successful in their hunting territories. Uh, they were marginalized by just simply dying off. Yeah. And 
eventually became extinct. When they became extinct is the debate that goes on and on and on. <laughs> I've heard a date as early as 39,000. I've heard a date as late as 29,000. My guess, if you wanted me to guess, I'd say probably around 30,000. It, it seems most likely that the last Neanderthals survived in Spain, where the environment was somewhat more benign. <clears throat> but we don't really know. An awful lot of trouble, and the troubles is that a great deal of the excavation, which uh, revealed the Cro-Magnon, was done 50 to 100 years ago. So the techniques were much cruder. I mean, it is staggering. Even in the last 10 years, the amount of information that can now be obtained from collections that were made, oh, yeah. decades ago. For example, one of the things they're doing, and this is an example from England, from near Stonehenge, they found a burial there of a guy with a bow. And looking at the isotopic signature of his teeth, they were able to show that he was brought up in Central Europe. Hmm. You're now looking at movement, interaction. And I think in the next 50 years, we're going to learn a great deal more about the way Cro-Magnons functioned. Right. It, I th it, it's quite interesting that wherever we go, other species <laughs> disappear. I mean, the, the Neanderthals, they were living, have been living in, uh, in Europe for, for quite a while before we came. And I think it's, oh, yeah. it's, I think it was the same thing when, wasn't it the same thing when modern man came to, to, to uh, America, that there were a lot of very big animals over there that also became extinct when... That is like, a big debate. Oh, is it? Like the big the giant sloths and... Yeah. No, there were animals that became extinct. Yeah. Question. Was this due to human beings, as some people, this was a very fashionable theory 50 years ago, ah. where humans came in and literally swept the Americas of large animals? Or was it the result of much drier conditions after the Ice Age by global warming, a natural global warming, or what? Hmm. The answer is... And this is a horrifying thing to say. We don't know. <laughs> as, it, as it often is with science. Having said that, I think it was a combination of all kinds of things. There's no question that the drying climate placed major stress on such large animals as the mastodon. Um, probably humans, in fact, humans did indeed kill uh, mastodons in considerable numbers, but did they drive them extinct, the slow breeding mastodon? We can't ask the mastodons or the people. <laughs> we don't know. No. But it's probably a, a complex mixture of different things. Yeah, yeah. I think the first time I saw a, 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 um, like a made-up picture of one of these, I just got blown away. I mean, I can't remember how big how big they like we believe they were, but they were huge, right? Like an elephant, or even <laughs> even bigger than some elephants. Mammoths actually uh, are fairly compact animals, which is an adaptation to the climate. Hmm. And of course, they had the long hair. An African elephant's a big beast. Uh, I've walked among a herd of elephants. So I never want to do that again. <laughs> the amazing thing was they were in a thick bush and they were so quiet. Yeah. They really were. They would, you know, they didn't, they, they knew I wasn't bothering them. They didn't bother me. But no, um, it's very humbling to be in the presence of large animals. It really is. It must have been such an, I mean, for us, humans living right now being in the presence of these huge animals but what about i mean being hunting like these wild oxes like uh, d during like 35,000 40,000 years ago it must have been such a i mean flow experience where you're, you're just so f hyper focused and really doing like everything you can because if something goes wrong you're you're you can't be dead <laughs> 
I mean, we're quite high stakes, especially mustard means quite high stakes, especially with these, with these more aggressive animals. Oh, one one slice of a, a horn of a wild oxen would wipe you out fast. Yes. Um, and one of the points I made in my book, actually, which something struck me, a lot of stuff I started to write this, but then it struck me. One thing was, and I've observed this at first hand in Africa, the amount of time that really good hunters simply lie on the ground and watch. They observe the animals. Mm. One of the keys to a successful hunt of any animal, especially big ones, is observing them. What are their weak spots? When is their attention less prominent? When are they completely relaxed? When are they on guard? When are they aggressive? When are they not? All that you have to know. How do they react to different climate conditions? How do they like wind or dust? So you spend a lot of time observing rather than hunting. The biggest skill of hunting, beyond obviously being able to shoot the weapon, is stalking. Yeah. I once went on a hunt of an antelope with an African gentleman whose only weapon was one of those 17th century flintlock muskets. You know who have flintlock? Yeah, yeah. And you aimed in the general direction of the animal and hoped you would hit it. And the only way you'll get a fatal shot or one way you could wound the animal was literally to get within 20 yards of the animal. Or, or t let's say 10 meters, 20 meters. Yeah. And it took hours. And the time we did it, he missed. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, that that's the skill. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Probably a prehistoric hunter with a bow would have got the animal. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's a very, very dangerous, tricky business. And the art of it is observation and knowing your animal. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, uh, like a f fully grown, like a like a twenty eight year old hunter during this time must have been such a such a fantastic hunter, like in or uh, fantastic. I must have had such such fantastic skills. I mean, being you get able up to... in the morning. Sorry? you get up in the morning and, and you shave. I see you're growing a beard like me, but you <laughs> shave. Yeah. Or you boil an egg yeah or you drive a motor car yeah you do these things without thinking about it exactly they did this without thinking about it and they used the skills they have without thinking about it if you see what i mean yeah it was they trained into them from birth yeah it was as natural as going to the bathroom i mean literally it, it, it's just part of them. And that's the skill we miss. Oh, by the way, I'm a loyal Swede. I drive a Volvo. Oh, you are? <laughs> that's nice. It's a Jörg Röller, is it? It's, it's a wonderful it, motor car, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that, that's very good. Do, are you feeling safe? They're known to be safe in the US, right? It, uh, oh, yeah. They're, they're safe, they're solid, and they are great fun to drive. I like it. I'm comfortable. And you also get to think about Sweden. Oh, indeed. Yes. <laughs> I admire Sweden. Having sailed there, I admire it very much. Yeah, you told me before it. You, you've been sailing in Jata Canal. That's great. I've sailed right across. Yeah. In the most beautiful summer weather. It was lovely. <laughs> yeah. Do you, but uh, one thing that I was also wondering about the, about the Neanderthals was, were they, I mean, how much of a spiritual life did they have? How much how much do we know about if if they like how much or what do we believe that they believed we don't know we have the clue uh, i think uh, they certainly had some group dynamics uh, they must have had some feelings they buried the dead yeah so they must have had some maybe belief in an afterlife or certainly they were um what's the word i want they were um, concerned with disposing of bodies out of the way. 
um, there were cases of Neanderthals buried with offerings. So they must have had some form of social life, but we just simply don't know. Right. They certainly were not, just as I said earlier, beasts no. hauling their women around by the hair. Oh, mm. no, they were, they were more sophisticated than that. Yeah. Another thing that I was I wanted to bring up, how do you think that the Cro-Magnons differed from us, contemporary humans? Now, are you talking about socially, behavior, or what? I, yeah, I, I assume that that must have been like the biggest, the biggest changes or, or the biggest differences. But yeah, yeah, like socially, behaviorally, because because biologically, as I understand, we were quite quite similar. But biologically, we were similar. Yeah. Where it all changes is in the mind and in the ways in which we've re responded to environments and so on. Yeah. As I said earlier, you cannot judge. Cromagnol society by or uh, them as people by looking at us. No, exactly. We're suburban, urban Europeans of the 21st century. It's almost as much of a jump for us to understand the Cromagnols as it was for the Cromagnols to understand the Neanderthals. Yeah. Because one thing that that is quite fascinating with us human beings is, I mean, even though we we share share the same biology, we can differ in, I mean, in our software. If you're if you're grown up in in the U.S. or China or or in Zimbabwe or in Sweden or England, we I mean we we become different persons depending on where we grew up. So it would be such so interesting to know like how how the culture affected these yeah these earlier humans they were people of their world and they were brilliantly adapted to us to it we have adapted to our worlds in different ways some successful some not and we're just like any other human beings yeah they were too what what do you yourself think is most fascinating about these uh, about the Cro Magnons? Oh, without question, how they lived in this extraordinarily demanding, constantly changing environment. I mean, we are now all obsessed with global warming, and quite rightly so too. These people had constantly to be on their ground guard for short term climate change, which literally could be a temperature drop overnight yeah 20 degrees to way sub zero they had to be constantly on their guard for that they had to constantly worry about acquiring food and they had to be on their day or constant demand looking for predators stalking them just to mention a few yeah very hazardous yeah yeah, that's not, that must have been. I mean, just to think, just to think about not being able to go into a home. You, you, you have to think of them, and this is true from the very, very earliest humans, long before modern humans. You, you must think of this all in terms of home bases. Yeah. And uh, Cro-Magnon's home base would change constantly. They must have had many of them. Uh, winter rock shelters or places where they habitually went for the winter. But a lot of the time they were in camps. They might stay a week and move on. They were so used to moving it didn't bother them. Right. Because most of in fact, their toolkits were remarkably portable. They could carry them around. Unlike farmers who have heavy grinding stones and so on, these folk had spears, spear throwers, scrapers, poly bags with stone tools in them. And they built shelters if they needed them. And they had skins. And they had a base they went back to. And every territory they used probably had some sort of simple or elaborate base. Yeah. Then, of course, <clears throat> you've got the other catalyst, which is the places where important spiritual activities were carried on, like the cave at Altamira, 
<clears throat> Lasco, the Grotte de Chauvet, Neo, and the other great caves with their paintings. These were places that were habitually visited and probably had uh, shamans or guardians who were nearby most of the time. Yeah. Um, Brian, bef before we stop, is there something else that you that, that we missed that you think is important to mention about the Cro-Magnons or something related to it? Well, I think the thing we haven't talked about at all is the cave art. Yeah, let's go with the cave art. The cave art, if you want to experience the Neanderthals, you want to go and look at the great caves, or at least the replicas now. They've got a, a marvelous replica of Lac Lascaux, one of the Grotte de Chauvet, one of Altamira. These are really worth seeing because there you could not only admire the art for what it is, and some of it's absolutely brilliant, but you can see, for example, imprints of Cro-Magnon hands on the walls. Yeah where they put their hands on the walls and probably were acquiring spiritual power from the forces of the animals, the spiritual forces of the animals on the walls. Really? Who lurk behind the walls. So they, they take like power that. from them? Yeah, power. Because these were powerful places, that is quite clear. Yeah. And in the caves too, and you can't have this experience with the electric light, but it happened to me years ago with an acetylene lamp in a cave where the lamp flickered, but the animals on the wall seemed to move as well. Yeah. And it's clear these shaman with their fat lamps were well aware of the theatrical power yeah. of light. Yeah. Because... This was a living world. It wasn't a dead world. So if you get a chance, go and see the art. It's worth it. And if you go to Lazesi, go to the museum and look at some of the bone and antique tools. They are quite simply exquisite. And you gasp at the skill of the men and women who engraved and painted these extraordinary images. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's wonderful stuff. Yeah. And well worth seeing. And also, I mean, all just to just this, also to see a hand against a wall that was made probably I don't know how many like thirty thousand, forty thousand years ago. That there was somebody standing there at that point in time and having their hand on the wall, and then that you can see it. It's just, yeah, it's quite quite fascinating. It's no, they, great they're, to see. They're, Hand imprints are found in cave art in all kinds of places, in South Africa for one, yeah. and so on. Now, um, the real thing about all this art is not the art itself, it's what it means. Yeah. And this is, again, the subject of great controversy. How old the oldest art is, nobody knows. It could be as much in Southeast Asia as 40,000 years old, as claimed, I exclaimed the Neanderthals painted in Spain, but this is subject to much criticism. Mm. But certainly the height of Cro-Magnon art is something that you should see during your lifetime. Yeah, I would love to check that out. Especially also when, when learning more. I mean, seeing these, seeing these um, different tools, like the Swiss army knife that you mentioned before, these different tools for different tasks, is also, I mean, understanding also how advanced it must have been during that time period also makes it more, more interesting when, I mean, when, when visiting such a museum or, or such an ex exhibition. Oh, yes. Now, you want to go out and see the lace easy, the, 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 the caves themselves, just the scenery is magnificent. Yeah. And imagine it all covered with snow, with animals and people. It must have really been something. For sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. I, I would also again mention that your book, your book name is Cro-Magnon: How the Ice Age gave birth to the gave birth to the first modern humans, and um, it, it's been really fascinating talking to you, Brian, about this. It's it's so interesting to to talk to, to somebody who knows 
a lot about these things and who knows about how our predecessors lived and or at least how we how we think they lived and how how their life must have been so so really big big thank you for taking your time to to well, talk it to really me it's very interesting because the um book has been savagely criticized by some people by saying oh there's not enough about the archaeology it's all about what it was like yeah but to me this is what it's all about yeah <laughs> yeah me it's too people like <laughs> and you can talk as much as you like about science and yeah. i don't think anyone can accuse me of taking not taking science seriously but you've got to make this live for today's people because they were very important yeah. And to preserve their sites and everything is also very important. Yeah, and I, and I mean, this, is, this of course varies from person to person, but I mean, the, the thing about trying to understand how their lives were, who they were, like how, how, how their social constellations worked, how, how they were behaving. I think for me, at least, I think that those are the interesting things to, to know, to learn more about. So. So I think. Oh, absolutely. That's that's the whole purpose. Because the ultimate purpose of studying the past is to understand people better and understand ourselves better, and that's something we very badly need to do. There is this one thing that I really hope for, one thing that I really dream of, and that is a subscription and a positive rating and a review from you on your podcast player. Hope you have a great day, friends. Take care. Bye.